Would you like to bow your heads with me in prayer? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have brought us together on your holy day to learn of you the things that we need to understand in order to be true followers of our Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, send your Holy Spirit among us today to speak to our hearts. And Lord, give us listening hearts that we may hear his words. And may we have a renewed desire in our hearts to be more and more like Jesus as we live in this world. I pray in his precious name. Amen. I want you to think about a very serious question this morning. Maybe you've never asked yourself that question before, or maybe not for a long time. My question is simply, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Now, there are many different answers which could be given to that question. But I wonder how many of us even stop to ask ourselves that question. Possibly, when you were baptized, you knew the answer to that question. When you were received into the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you knew why you were doing it. But do you have an answer to that question today? Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Now, one reason that you might give as an answer to that question is that you agree with the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Maybe when you were baptized, you had a series of baptismal vows. And those vows tend to focus on that aspect. And of course, it's very important that if you become a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, that you do both understand and accept all the teachings of the church. And yet, I'm aware of some things which puzzle me a little. Because the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church are, are changed from time to time. When I was baptized, there were 22 fundamental beliefs. And then from 1980 onwards, the 22 seemed to expand to 27. And now we have 28. And at the general conference session in San Antonio last year, our fundamental beliefs were revised and voted to be changed in various ways. One particularly struck me. Before those changes were voted through, one of the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was that Ellen G. White is the Lord's messenger. Now, for reasons that I don't understand, that's been dropped from our fundamental beliefs. And so according to the changes that have been voted at that recent general conference session, you don't have to believe that Ellen White was the Lord's messenger anymore. Now, why am I saying these things? Well, maybe saying you agree with the Fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church isn't a good enough reason for being a Seventh-day Adventist. And there's something else which puzzles me too, and something which has happened in my lifetime. 
there was a time when if you disagreed with the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you left. And you found others who thought as you did and you worshipped with them. But that seems to have changed today. Nowadays, if you don't agree with the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you remain a member and you seek to change the church to come round to your point of view from inside. For example, a significant number of Seventh-day Adventists today are believers in evolution rather than creation as recounted in the opening chapters of the Bible. But rather than leaving the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they've stayed within the Seventh-day Adventist Church and they're trying to use every method they can to bring the church around to the teaching of evolution. And so they teach it in our schools and in our colleges and in our universities. And they hope that the young people will influence the church to gradually change round. Of course, what they do is they try to blend evolution in the Bible, and they call it theistic evolution. In other words, it's the evolution teaching of Darwin, but with God sort of fitted onto the side of it somewhere. A significant number of Seventh-day Adventists don't really believe the Sixth Commandment anymore. I do hope you know what the Sixth Commandment is. It's one of the shortest of all the commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Nowadays, it's thought that it's a matter of personal opinion whether you choose to become a soldier and learn how to use guns to shoot people and fight for your country. There are Adventists who believe that's a matter of personal opinion, whether you do that or not. There are other Adventists who believe that it's a matter of personal opinion whether a mother should allow her unborn baby to be killed in her womb. And Seventh-day Adventist hospitals routinely perform abortion on demand for mothers who want to kill their babies. Many Seventh-day Adventists no longer believe what the church used to teach about the 2,300 days and 1844. Many of them say the only significance of the year 1844 is that's the year when the Seventh-day Adventist movement began. It has no prophetic significance. And many of those who believe that don't believe in the sanctuary message. I could go on, but the fact is that people who are Seventh-day Adventists see nothing strange about rejecting Seventh-day Adventist teachings while remem remaining members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So it's no longer sufficient to say I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because I believe in the church's teachings. What other reason could there be for being a Seventh-day Adventist? Well, there are those who are Seventh-day Adventists for what I might call cultural reasons. You could say, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because my parents were Seventh-day Adventists. And many Seventh-day Adventists could say precisely that. When you go to the United States where Seventh-day Adventism began, there are people who could not only say my parents were Seventh-day Adventists, my grandparents, or even my great-grandparents, or my great-great-grandparents were Seventh-day Adventists. It's kind of a family tradition to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And many of those people went to Seventh-day Adventist schools and then progressed to Seventh-day Adventist colleges and Seventh-day Adventist universities. And many of them ended up being employed as workers in the Seventh-day Adventist church. 
But there's just a possibility that these people could become Seventh-day Adventists for very much the same sort of reasons as a person becomes a Muslim because he was born in a Muslim country or become a Roman Catholic, he was born in a Roman Catholic country. Is it enough to be a cultural Seventh-day Adventist? Of course, you might have had once really strong reasons for being a Seventh-day Adventist. But what about your reason today? Do you keep the Sabbath out of habit? Do you go to church on Sabbath out of habit? Now, don't get me wrong. It's not a, a bad habit to keep the Sabbath. It's not a bad habit to go to church on Sabbath. But is it, a, is it a good reason to be a Seventh-day Adventist out of habit? Or do you need stronger reasons than that? You see, we've been shown as a people that one day soon it's actually going to be very hard to be a Seventh-day Adventist. We've been shown that governments are going to pass laws to make it very hard to be a Seventh-day Adventist. How will you feel about being a Seventh-day Adventist when you go to the ATM and put your plastic card in and your card is refused? Or you go to the supermarket checkout to pay for the goods that you want to buy and your card is refused because you are a Seventh-day Adventist. How you feel when the government withdraws your right to buy and sell, so long as you remain a faithful Seventh-day Adventist. How will you feel about being a Seventh-day Adventist when your electricity is cut off? Because you're not allowed to buy electricity because you're a Seventh-day Adventist. When your gas is cut off, because you're not allowed to buy gas from the gas company, because you're a Seventh-day Adventist. When you can't even get water in your house, because you're not allowed to buy water from the water company. How will you feel when your house is taken away from you because you're not allowed to pay your taxes to the local commune. When the doctor won't treat you because you're not allowed to pay your bills. When your employer won't employ you anymore. Or if you're the same age as me, when the government no longer pays your pension. What will your reasons for being a Seventh-day Adventist be then? Or will you be one of those people who say, well, it doesn't really matter whether you're a Seventh-day Adventist or not. Why? Are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Are you thinking about it now? Let's go back one step. Why is there a Seventh-day Adventist church? I ask that question because if you know the answer to that question, and you should know the answer to my first question. It just might help you to know why there is a Seventh-day Adventist church. And to help to answer that question, I'm going to share with you some inspired words from Christ. I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 28, 
and then Mark chapter 16, and then Acts chapter 1. I'm going to read all three together. They're very familiar verses, and I think perhaps you will be able to almost recite them with me. First Matthew chapter, eight, tw chapter 28, where Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Mark chapter 16. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Acts chapter 1. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses for me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the world. That's why Jesus has a church. Let's now read some inspired counsel from the pen of the Lord's servant, specifically addressed to Seventh-day Adventists. The Church of Christ was organized for missionary purposes. Let me stop there. If the Church of Christ was raised up for missionary purposes, has any organization or group of people the right to call themselves the Church of Christ if they're not involved in missionary purposes? What do you think? Has any group of people got the right to call themselves the Church unless they are doing things for missionary purposes. If any group of people is doing nothing for the salvation of souls, can they call themselves Christ's church? Let me read a little further the quotation. The Church of Christ was organized for missionary purposes. Christian missionary work furnishes the church with a sure foundation. I think I'd want my church to have a sure foundation. What happens when a building doesn't have a sure foundation? Jesus told a parable about a man who built his house on sand and it didn't have a sure foundation. And what happened to that house? It fell flat. Christian missionary work furnishes the church with a sure foundation. And let me go on. A foundation having this seal the Lord knoweth them that are his. Think about that. If you are not involved in missionary work, if you are not running your life for missionary purposes, if your church is not involved in working in missionary lines, then the Lord cannot put his seal on you and on your church because the Lord knows that the ones who are his are his missionaries they are fulfilling the task that Christ gave his church to do to go and teach all the things that he commanded 
So the same question that we've been asking of the church can be asked of you. Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Are you a missionary for Christ? Are you doing anything for missionary purposes? Are you doing anything actively for the salvation of souls? Are you organizing yourself and those of you who think as you do to work to spread abroad the influence of the cross of Jesus Christ? These are serious questions. Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? You see, the Lord knows those who are his. That was actually a quotation from 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. And those are the ones upon whom he puts his seal. And the ones who he puts his seal upon are those who are doing what he wants them to do, to take his teaching to those who don't know it in this sad old world of ours. The problem that I see around me is not that Seventh-day Adventists are doing nothing. Seventh-day Adventists are very active people and very busy people. But the question you have to ask is, what is all that effort and activity directed towards? What I'm going to say now may offend some of you, and I'm sorry if it does. So much effort and so much interest is expended at the moment on what we call the health message. I'm interested that in the whole of the writings of Ellen White, all those millions of words, she never once used the words, the health message. That's our term today. And so there are presentations about health going on in many, many different places. My question is this. Are these presentations about health fulfilling any Christian missionary purpose. I remember years ago when my father, as the elder of the local Seventh-day Adventist church, was told that in our town there was going to be a five-day plan to stop smoking. And this was Christian missionary work, we were told. Except we were told it was in connection with the local Department of Health. And we as Seventh-day Adventists were not to mention that it was anything to do with the Seventh-day Adventist Church or talk to the people who came to this program about Seventh-day Adventist teachings. It's a good thing to help people to stop smoking. But if that's not a step towards getting them into the kingdom of God, that's not the church's work. That's not Christian missionary purposes. Do health presentations which leave Christ out do anything actively for the salvation of souls? Do they in any way lift up the cross of Christ? Do they bring doomed sinners to the only one who can provide a solution for life's problems. Yes, you can teach them about vegetarianism. You can teach them to be vegans. You can teach them what every single vitamin in the alphabet does to help their health. You can teach them about aloe vera, echinacea, garlic, onions, leeks, Cucumbers, melons, some of you may recognize, I've got that list from the Bible, and it isn't a good source of that list.
But if you do not take them one step closer to the kingdom of God, unless you uplift Christ in your presentation about health, then you do not do them any good at all. Because sinners, whether they're healthy or unhealthy, will not inherit the kingdom of God without Jesus Christ. Did Christ bring you into his truth so that you could expend your efforts on making healthy sinners? Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? There was a time when the we as Seventh-day Adventists used to talk about the present truth. It was a phrase we got from the Bible, from 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. The Bible contains many, many truths, and all those truths are precious. But the present truth is the truth that prepares people to meet Jesus face to face when he comes. And it is the present truth that the Seventh-day Adventist church was raised up to preach. If you want the simplest presentation of present truth, you'll find it in the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12. And I think it's not at all without significance that the desk that I'm standing at today has those three angels on the front. But have you noticed those three angels are disappearing from the Seventh-day Adventist Church? We've created a new logo for the Seventh-day Adventist Church which consists of six wavy lines looking remarkably like a large number of corporate logos you see in the business world. The Santander Bank, for example, uses those wavy lines for their corporate logo. The new logo contains an open book, which we're told is the Bible. And in the background, not the foreground, there's the outline of a cross. And many people have told me that as they look at that cross, it seems to them to be upside down. There's something wrong there. What is present truth? The big question. I'm going to try to answer that very shortly and very simply. So the question is, what is the truth which is especially important at this present time in this world's history? What is the truth which God especially wants us to present to sinners in the closing stages of this world's history? We better know it, because Ellen White gives us this warning. If the mind is filled with other things, the present truth is shut out. And we as Seventh-day Adventists can fill our minds with so many other things. And if we do, and if we become obsessed with other things, so we think about other things all the time, then there'll be no place in our thinking for the present truth. If the mind is filled with other things, the present truth is shut out. And then she goes on to say something which is very, very solemn. There is no place in our foreheads for the seal of the living God. Now I'll read the whole quotation again. If the mind is filled with other things, present truth is shut out and there is no place in our foreheads for the seal of the living God. 
and brothers and sisters, if you do not have in your forehead the seal of the living God, you have the other thing, the mark of the beast. Because the world is going to be divided into two warring camps. And if you do not have the seal of God, then you will have the mark of the beast. In another place she writes, the message of present truth is to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. And in another place she calls it the warning message of present truth. A warning message. You give a person a warning when there is some danger coming. If they step out into the road and there's a bus coming down the road at speed, you shout to warn them to get back on the sidewalk because otherwise they'll be killed. Warnings are important. And yet I get the feeling that Seventh-day Adventists are not very happy about giving the warning message anymore because warnings can frighten people. What is this warning message that we are to give? I've suggested in just six points as the heart of this message. The first warning is that Jesus is coming again soon and that we need to be ready. Now, if you don't believe that, then you have no right to call yourself an Adventist. Because that's what the word Adventist means. It means that you believe that Jesus is coming again and we have to be ready. It was that motivation that made William Miller do his great work in the 1830s and early 1840s. So that's the first aspect of the present truth, to warn people that Jesus is coming again soon and we need to be ready. What's the second aspect? The second aspect is to warn people that if they are not ready for Jesus to come, then they will be consumed in flames when he comes. Now that's something that people don't like to talk about. But it's true. It's what the Bible teaches. You are either ready or you are consumed. And that's the warning that we have to give. What's the third aspect? It's the message of warning that even now the Lord is judging the human race, all people, to show whether they are ready or whether they are not, whether they will be saved or whether they will be consumed. The first angel's message says, the hour of his judgment is come. When Paul preached before the Roman governor back in the book of Acts, he warned about a judgment to come because it hadn't yet come. We can't say that anymore because the hour of God's judgment has come. And not one of us knows when our eternal destiny will be revealed in that judgment. What's the fourth aspect of present truth? It's the message that the judgment of God is based upon God's law and that those who do not obey God's law will be the ones who are consumed. So it's a warning that we have to keep the commandments of God. All of them. Now, some people think that's a bit unkind. Surely God will accept us if we, are, we score 9 out of 10 in the test. But God is not like school teachers. 9 out of 10 is not a good enough mark in God's judgment. It's not a good enough mark even in the world we live in today. 
Suppose you are speeding in your car and the policeman pulls you over. You cannot say to him, look, I've been keeping all the other laws of Denmark. It's only one law I've broken. Surely I'm okay. Breaking one law makes you a lawbreaker and you come under the condemnation of the law. And God is no different. The one who keeps all the points but offends in one, says the Bible, is guilty of all. It's just the same in real life as it is in God's judgment. What else is present truth? It is the message that those who have broken his law and who confess their sins and repent will find bounteous mercy from God. And that is part of the present truth. It's not only a warning. It is to show them a God who is willing to accept sinners no matter what they have done, no matter how bad their lives may have been, if only they'll come to him and seek his mercy, confessing their sins and repenting. Repentance, of course, is important, and that's very much an aspect of present truth. Repentance, I heard once a definition given by a little child, and I think it makes a great deal of sense. Repentance means being so sorry for what you have done, that you'll never do it again. Simple as that. Repentance means being so sorry for what you've done wrong that you'll never do it again. And that's what God is looking for. Those who are ready for Jesus to come will be people who have truly repented with all their hearts. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about why it appears that Christ's coming has been delayed. And he explains it very simply. He says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what the Lord is looking at. The Lord is not going to condemn people for the things that they have done wrong in the past, provided they come to repentance, provided that they are so sorry about the bad things that they have done, that they have made the determined decision that they're not going to do them again. And that is the mercy of the Lord. And the final aspect of present truth that I want to share with you. It's the message that those who truly repent and put their total trust in the one who is able for, to keep them from falling into sin will find that he will truly save his people from their sins. And this is a gospel that you just don't hear very much today. You hear that Jesus can forgive and praise the Lord, he will forgive. But more than that, he will keep us from falling so that he can present us faultless before the presence of his glory. And that will cause great joy, great joy for those who've been kept from falling. Great joy for our Savior who has kept us from falling. And joy in heaven. Because Christ said there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. And that is part of the present truth. We need to point people to the one who is able to keep them from falling, keep them from sinning, after they have put their lives right with Jesus. 
Let me ask you a question, the familiar question. Are you a Seventh-day Adventist because you believe the present truth? Are you a Seventh-day Adventist because you know from personal experience that the present truth is true because you've had it proved true in your own life? And are you a Seventh-day Adventist because you believe it's your God-given responsibility to share the present truth with other people so that they can know your Savior like you know him? Are you a Seventh-day Adventist because you've taken up the responsibility that Jesus has given you and you're actively involved in sharing the present truth with people who do not know it? Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Ellen White warns that the time will come when the gold will be separated from the dross and it will be made apparent who are godly, who are loyal and true, and who are the disloyal, the dross and the tinsel. And she said, what clouds of chaff will then be borne away by the fan of God, when now our eyes can discover only rich floors of wheat will be chaff blown away with the fan of God. It's a serious statement, this. What she is saying is that there are many people who look as though they are good Seventh-day Adventists. But when that fan of God blows, when the angels let go the four winds, a lot of those Seventh-day Adventists would just be blown away because there is nothing of substance in their Seventh-day Adventism. They have the name, but there's no substance behind the name. She goes on to say, Many, everyone who is not centered in Christ will fail to stand the test and ordeal of that day. Then it will be seen whether the choice is for Christ or Belial. You see, there is a danger that we can be just like the church of Sardis spoken about in Revelation chapter 3. Do you remember what it was said about them? They have a name that they're living, but really, they're spiritually dead. I read these words and they made me stop and think. From Ellen White in Testimonies, volume eight, page 148. Not one in 100 among us is doing anything beyond engaging in common worldly enterprises. How much of your life is involved in common worldly enterprises? Yes, we have to get ourselves involved in common worldly enterprises because we live in this world. But if that is the sum total of your life, then you'll be found wanting when Jesus comes. We've been told we have little enough of Christ's character. We must reveal that love which dwelt in Jesus. Then we shall keep the commandment that we love one another, which not one in 100 of us who claim to believe the truth for this time are keeping. Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? What are you doing with the precious truths, the present truths that God has committed to you for this time? Will the Lord 
call you a Seventh-day Adventist when the judgment is concluded and the winds begin to blow? Or will you be among the chaff which is blown away by the fan of God? I plead with you to ponder over this question that I've asked you and seek an honest answer in your own heart and soul. Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? May God bless each one of you. Will you bow your heads in prayer? Our Father in heaven, like Esther, we have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Lord, you have a purpose for your remnant people to carry out in this world before probation closes and Jesus comes. Lord, make us willing to be part of that purpose, to warn a perishing world before it is too late. Show us day by day the things that we can do, the things that we can say, the letters and the emails we can write, the telephone calls we can make to warn those whom we come in contact with that the hour of his judgment is come and it's time to be ready for our Saviour to return. Lord, you have a work for every one of us to do and it's a work that you have given us special, unique talents to do. Lord, may we pray, each of us, day by day, Lord, show me what my work for you is this day. And then may we be willing to do what you show us to do. And then we will know why we are truly Seventh-day Adventists. Lord, bless each one whose head is bowed before you now. And may not one of them be missing on that great day when Jesus returns to take his people home. I pray this in his precious name. Amen. Thank you.